Okay. Yeah. Works World Headquarters, the nexus of everything about music and learning music and everything like that. I'm Daryl, Daryl Anger, I'm a fiddle player, as you can see, and uh, thank you, sir. I've just been uh, apprised of the location of the, uh, the uh, conduit to the rest of the world, and so now I'm looking at y'all out there. You look great for the middle of the afternoon on a Thursday afternoon. You look fine. Don't change a thing. Everything's good. So yeah, we're just sitting here. Um, I'm uh, recording some violin lessons for uh, you know some of the many many students that are on my online fiddle school, and we thought we'd just do a little live broadcast and talk about stuff. Um, I'm playing right now. I'm playing one of my beautiful fiddles that was made by a fellow who I know, which is always nice if you know the person who made your instrument. Uh, an instrument is. It's like a tool, but it's more than a tool. It's almost alive. It's like a collaborator. It's somebody that uh, you are, you know, very dependent on to get your sound out. And it's, uh, you know, a really great instrument. It's going to react to everything you do and kind of have its own opinion about it and uh, hopefully contribute to the general effect of what's going on. So this one's a beautiful instrument. <laughs> Named by Barry Dudley down in Georgia. Any mistakes uh, that I make in the course of this uh, broadcast, you know, are solely my responsibility. Have nothing to do with the maker of the instrument. So there you have it. Um, I know that you're supposed to do that as kind of uh, disclaimer. So yeah, uh, but there's another fiddle in the room, isn't there? There's, uh, we've been kind of thinking about that. Um, one of the biggest questions that people have, you know, we have a lot of beginner students on the site and they're always wondering, well, what should I look for? You know, what should I, should I buy a new instrument? Should I buy an old instrument? Should I buy one? So, uh, you know, if, if a guy comes up to me on the street and offers me a, a violin, you know, and it's like he's got it in his uh, you know, overcoat, he opens up his overcoat and there's the violin. Should I buy it? Well, probably not, but you know, the general quality of brand new instruments, especially um, starter violins, has really gone up a lot in the last 20 or 30 years. And that's exactly just what we happen to have here. Actually, somebody, um, let's take a look at this one here. Let's, this is a brand new instrument and uh, you, uh, you paid like what, like 120 bucks for it? Probably, like I didn't actually pay for it this time, it was an exchange, but the standard price for that one where I got it is, yeah, it's probably around 120. Standard price, $120 for a very nice looking instrument. All the parts are, you know, attached. It's got all four strings, that's very cool. And uh, yeah, so let's take a look at this thing. Let's see what's going on with it. Uh, I'm just going to put my little orthopedic device. Now, many, many, many violin players like to, you know, ultimately you should be able to just put the violin in your chin, walk around, do everything you do. You know, you can go to the bank, you know, maybe like, you know, uh, drive while you're just holding the violin. But for many of us, that is a, a lot easier if we get one of these little shoulder rest jobs that just slip right on the back of the violin. Then all of a sudden, then it really is easy. I could do just about anything. I could like, you know, shuck oysters or you know, uh, sort cabbage or whatever it is that, that musicians do to make money. All right, so this is a nice looking instrument. It's very clean. The lines are clean. It's all the joints are, you know, the, the, the seams. Violin is made up of about 144 parts, all separate parts that all get glued together and shaped and uh, then we have this, and there's a, like the bridge. Uh, the bridge is movable. The bridge actually could come right off the instrument if it wasn't being held down by the strings. And that is actually a thing that can be adjusted very easily if you do, you know, if you, if you hold it right and are careful. 
and you can actually move the bridge into the right position. And you can see that they're on these, on what we call the F holes, because they look like F. Well, this one looks like an F, this one looks like a backwards F. That's what it looks like. Um, there's, they have these little nicks in the holes that tell you where the bridge is supposed to go. And that's the, the function of those. So looks like the bridge is now in the perfect position. Uh, we want to make sure that the bridge isn't leaning over one way or the other. And this bridge is leaning a little bit, you can see, but it's not too bad. It doesn't look like it's going to fall over anytime soon. You can see that up there? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Can, oh, we got so many cameras here, I don't know which one to look at. Okay. Well, first thing, we probably want to get this thing in tune. Look at that. Okay, so here's the $8,000 fantastically beautiful instrument that I love. And here's the $120 reasonably okay looking instrument that I have no emotional attachment to whatsoever. And here they are together. Um, I think on a cursory examination, you'd say that they're pretty much the same, right? Well, let's see what's going to happen if I tune this thing up. And I'm going to get a reference tone here. Being a professional musician, I can remember what that sounds like, at least for 30 seconds. And then I'm going to use these pegs. Now, most violins are using 14th century technology on the tuning pegs. And that can cause problems because they're only held in by friction. But if they're adjusted right, that friction is going to work fine for us. But one thing we also like is we make the big adjustments up here, these, these pegs that are held in by friction, and then uh, we have a little tailpiece down here with little geared tuners that, that make the fine adjustments for us. Well, we have to make them ourselves, but it's a lot easier than trying to wiggle a friction peg back and forth. So now we're roughly in the ballpark, the violin is tuned. Uh, G, a G note, in case we, all of you out there with perfect pitch, that's pretty close to G right now, we're going to make it closer. And then a fifth away is a D, and then a fifth away from that is an A, and then an, an, an E. So G, D, A, E, same difference between all the strings, which is very handy if you're trying to improvise, do any of that. Those of you who are guitar players know that there's kind of a funny anomaly in the tuning of that instrument. One string is a different interval. Oh, I forgot the bow, the new, the new bow. Let's go in, let's go down and get that bow. I'm going down the stairs here. Oh, no, sir, I'm getting farther, farther away. Okay, oh, I'm coming back, I got the bow. I'm coming back, here I come, uh, yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> Uh, it's that time of the day. Things get a little nutty. All right, so here we have a cake of rosin. Don't try to eat it just because it's cake. It's not really cake. It's just a... So we rub. This is a brand new bow. It's made out of, looks like probably plastic or fiberglass, which is just fine. Nothing wrong with that. Um, there's a whole new generation of violin bows and, and cello bows and every other kind of bow that are made out of carbon fiber, which is what they make jet fighters out of. And I would think that making instrument bows out of jet material is definitely in the category of making uh, plowshares out of swords and the admirable uh, activity indeed. Um, yeah, I don't have any problem with, you know, and especially the carbon fiber bows are great because, uh, you know, when you think about us and trees and everything that's alive, there's a heck of a lot of carbon in us, and so carbon fiber is not really that different from a tree trunk, really, if you think about it, which I think too much. 
Okay, so we've got a rosined up bow here. We don't want to use too much rosin. We don't want to tighten the bow too much. Just enough. So let's see what this $120 fiddle sounds like. It's a little squeaky, but I think that's partly the bow. I'd probably have to spend another 10 minutes rosining the bow and I don't think anybody's got time to see that, but um, bow feels fine. It's fine, nothing wrong with it. When I pick up my bow, it feels finer. Sounds really good. kind of electric guitar kind of sound that makes me want to play Purple Haze. That's uh, not bad at all. Let's go back to the old one and see how they compare here. Setup details make the bridge fit, feet fit a little better on the top. Uh, you might want to even lower the bridge a tiny bit, less than the sixteenth of an inch. That would make it a little bit more comfortable to play. But basically, it sounds like you know it's got music in it, and you can we can get it out. We can get the music out of this instrument. It's going to be fine. So. Yeah, this is, this is looking up, this is great. Um, you, know, you can get into a decent instrument for 120 bucks if you get the right one. They're, every one is gonna be different. You have to try them. Uh, if you go down to the store, look at these things. Uh, don't be afraid of the old ones. You just have to make sure that all the seams are not uh, open. You, know, you don't want anything falling off the instrument. But, uh, you know, uh, this is really nice, and nobody's probably ever played it before, and so that's kind of cool. You know, you, uh, you just start a relationship with a brand new instrument, and that's that's great. This one's kind of beautiful. So, yeah, uh, I think that you know, it's 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 not a bad idea to start with a new instrument, start a new hobby, playing the fiddle. Uh, and uh, I congratulate everybody that's started doing that uh, at my school and artist works and people that are, have started doing it and are not studying with me, although I think it might, it might be a good idea if you want to, that would be good. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's easier than ever to start on the fiddle. I think that's what I'm trying to say. And um, it's, you know, one of those things that uh, Guitar licks, you could play 
uh, country fiddle licks, you could play Tchaikovsky, you could play fake Tchaikovsky, all that stuff is, uh, it works great on this instrument. And it takes a little while, I admit, the learning curve is not what you'd get with a ukulele, for instance. Uh, but you can do so much more on a violin than you can with a ukulele. And I guess that's the carrot, it's also the stick, but um, we have a stick right here. So anyway, uh, nice uh, seeing everybody. You all look great still. Might be a you know, little bludgeoned by the whole thing, but uh, stay with it. Friday's close, it's coming in. And then there's the weekend and it's spring, so yeah. Um, yeah, go buy a fiddle. Awesome. Was that stressful? <laughs> uh, you know, blathering is always a little stressful. <laughs> oh, wing it. That was excellent. Someone asked, does it chop? I didn't chop? know what that meant. Oh, how, yeah, does, it how does it chop? Yeah. How does it chop? Oh, yeah, the chop. I right, completely, yeah. Well, I'm still wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, yeah, the chop, well, the chop's fine. You know, chop is really, the chop is really one of the easiest things to, because, you know, chop is not about tone, right? Chop is about the spaces between the sound.